for science journalism from the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Indeed, one of our guests tonight, John Holdren, is a former president of the AAAS. Bruce has reported from Africa, China, Europe, and the former Soviet Union and South America and produced stories about land use in the Amazon, that's the region, not the company, and uh, Mato Grosso, agriculture in Bolivia's Ataplano, fishing in Uganda, and the Chernobyl reactor disaster in Ukraine. He is also one of my all-time favorite public radio reporters and storytellers. Ladies and gentlemen, Bruce Gellerman. has more hair, <laughs> which is why I love radio, you know, it's uh, <laughs> well, it taps into your imagination, right? That's, you get better pictures. So, uh, which, which is, I have to be honest with you, well, I was, um, I didn't like the idea about city space when I first heard it. I know that's blasphemy, but first of all, this was my bike shop. <laughs> and uh, second of all, I thought, well, you know, the, the, to have a place, a physical place, when the world is going virtual, right? And we have social media, and we've got, you can broadcast from anywhere in the world with a phone. Uh, uh, that it just seemed weird to me, and 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 then I started thinking about it, and I saw this place being built, <laughs> and I thought, oh my God, this is incredible! What an amazing idea, you know, to have a community and a curious community come together in a conversation. Wow. And, 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 and so to bring people, you know, together into that conversation, it, it just, it's so exciting. And uh, I'm really pleased to be here, and I'm pleased that you're here. So um, let me just introduce you very briefly. Barbara Moran is on the uh, Earthwhile team. She's the head of the, uh, the vertical, we call it. Uh, Barbara, are you here? Oh, she's hiding. Live tweeting. Yeah. <laughs> so so I, Barbara is one of the few people who is as nerdy as me. She's an extraordinary journalist, and we connected immediately, and I so enjoy working with her. She's so talented. And um, Miriam Wasser is here, too, I think. Miriam, are you here? Oh, there's Miriam. She's, 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 uh, she's starting out in the vertical now. Tomorrow is our first official piece, I think, for for the vertical, uh, the Earthwhile, and um, it has something to do with the oceans. Uh, it has to do with whale poop. <laughs> <coughs> okay, it's a serious story, though. <laughs> so anyhow, so uh, you may have uh, heard the news today. Are you hot enough, by the way? I mean, it's warm enough for you because the news today was that uh, the this is the fourth hottest. A year, 2018 was the fourth hottest year in, uh, since they've been recording it to uh, surface temperature, mean surface temperature since, what, 140 years or so. And uh, the last five years have been the five hottest years. So the world is getting warmer. And, and uh, that's a, um, it can be very dangerous, scary uh, idea. It's happening, climate change is here, it's real, it's affecting us. Um, but, there's, but, but there's hope, I really do mean that. And I hope that in the conversation that we're gonna have tonight, you'll understand, and I hope, we haven't talked about this uh, with the guests, but that um, I think there's, I think we're gonna make it, we're gonna, we're gonna buy time, we're gonna, we, we are gonna buy time. And uh, this, this place, this place, Boston, this place, New England, is leading the effort, and um, I have confidence in us. So, um, we're, I'm very thankful that we have two incredible world experts in this subject, Hal Harvey and John Holdren. I'll invite them to come up. As they're coming up, I'll, I'll, I'll explain who they are. So these two men are at the forefront of the science, the policies, 
the politics, the programs that I think are going to get us from here to there. Hal Harvey, there. I've met him before tonight, and we had an incredible conversation. Actually, I listened mostly. Uh, he's the CEO of Energy Innovation, a San Francisco-based energy. Where's my book, by the way? Oh, my book. <laughs> I Thank gave you. it to Hal. Uh, <laughs> don't. So th <laughs> th he, he's, um, he's the CEO of Energy uh, Innovation. Uh, he's been doing that since 2012. He founded it. And he's um, delivering high quality research and analysis to policymakers around the world to keep them informed about energy policy decisions. He's the founder of several environmental organizations, Climate Works, the Energy Foundation. He's the author of this book, which I'm actually so pleased to get because I was reading it on my phone and it's hard. And it's <laughs> awesome. It is awesome. I must tell you, I mean that sincerely. It's really an excellent book. Um, and uh, you built an electric car. Did, Did you really? In 1992, I took a Ford Escort and disemboweled it. Um, rip out the gas tank and the exhaust system and the engine and the suspension and the brakes and the steering system and most of the electrical. <laughs> and then I loaded it up with golf cart batteries, 18 <coughs> of them, um, and put in an electric motor and rebuilt the suspension so it could hold all those batteries and everything else and then put up solar panels to power it all so I had a zero carbon Whoa. vehicle. Um, not quite as good as the ones they make today, but <laughs> Hal Holdren is, uh, John Holdren is, um, was President of Obama's Senior White House Advisor on Science and Technology, the Office of Science, Technology, and Policy. Policy. Uh, he's a Professor of Environmental Policy at Harvard's Kennedy Center and Director of Science, Tech, and Policy at the Balfour Center. Do I have that right? Is that old? It's the I'm, I'm co-director of the Science, Technology, and Public Policy Program at the Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs at the Harvard Kennedy School. <laughs> all hangs together, more right. or less. But all it, there's more. Um, he was the director of the Woods Hole Research Center in Woods Hole. Uh, in 1995, Dr. Holdren delivered the Nobel Peace Prize acceptance lecture as chair of the executive committee of the Pugwash Conference on Science and World Affairs. It's an amazing thing. But there's something even more amazing. In 2009, he was, the Senate unanimously confirmed him as Obama's science advisor. That's amazing, because that would never happen today. <laughs> yeah. I was amazed, too. <laughs> So um, yesterday, State of the um, State of the Union address, um, there was no mention of the word climate or climate change or global warming. Not a single mention. It was conspicuous by its absence. Uh, Stacey Abrams, who delivered the Democratic response, used the word climate in passing, um, but not substantively. So uh, I. Do you share my feelings that this is the biggest problem that humanity faces and what we do now is going to be consequential forever? Do you agree with that? Absolutely. And uh, I can say that President Obama also agreed with it. Uh, when he took office in 2009, uh, in his first cabinet meeting, he said, obviously our immediate problem is dealing with the recession which we inherited. Uh, it's going to take a tremendous effort to get out of that recession. It's going to require uh, all of our skills and all of our resources to do it. But he said, as we move forward, the biggest challenge for the whole 20th century, or excuse me, the whole 21st century, is going to prove to be the climate change challenge uh, for the United States, for the world, uh, for all of us. And uh, he continued uh, to believe that and act on it throughout his administration. Uh, <coughs> And it was a great privilege of me to work with him uh, on that. But uh, I would say that the essence of the predicament we face in this domain can be summarized this way. Without energy, there is no economy. Without climate, there is no environment. And without economy and environment, there is no material well-being, there is no civil society, there is no security, personal 
or national or homeland, and the essence of the problem is that the global civilization is getting 80% of the energy that its economies need in ways that are wrecking the climate that its environment needs. That is the essence of the challenge. 80% of the world's primary energy, all of our energy supply, comes from coal, oil, and natural gas. In spite of all that you hear <laughs> about renewables and nuclear and energy efficiency, uh, the fact is, that we remain overwhelmingly dependent on fuels which, when they are burned with current technology, are pumping carbon dioxide into the atmosphere at a pace that is changing the Earth's climate in ways that are historically unprecedented, in ways that are faster than ecosystems and human systems can adjust, and in ways that are already undermining human well-being in its economic dimension, its health dimension, its environmental dimension, ultimately its social and security dimensions. That's the essence of the problem. Hal, Hal you have an interesting statistic, though, that bounces off. It's to make this manageable, right? So there's like 190 countries that were involved in the UN Conference on Climate Change, right? The, uh, and organized by what? The IPCC, the International Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which is the ones that do the science, the basic science. And, but you have a statistic in your book that says 75% of the carbon emissions come from just 20 countries. Do I have that right? You have that exactly right. So that makes it, it's seemingly a manageable problem. We don't have to deal with 190, although we have to deal with 190 in terms of the effects, the mitigation, and adaptation, and, and, and funding, and all the rest. And, but, but in terms of just managing 20 countries, that seems possible. So l let me first add a, a sentence or two about the climate change phenomena that we're facing because this informs the kinds of solutions we have to pursue. Um, and and there, are, there are two issues that one must always reckon with. One is natural changes are irreversible. Nature doesn't have a reverse gear. Today, extinctions are happening at between 1,000 and 10,000 times the background rate that they should happen. Um, if you defrost the tundra, you can't put the methane back in. So there's no reverse gear for this. And carbon takes millennia to precipitate out of the atmosphere, to transform out of the atmosphere. So what we do now, the, the harm we do today with fossil fuels is not quite the gift that keeps on giving for generations. It just keeps going. The second point is um, we do unleash natural systems which accelerate the whole thing and can take it beyond human hands if we're not careful. Uh, one of those is the one I mentioned. Uh, if you defrost the northern climes in Russia and Alaska and Canada, it's packed with soil carbon and methane, which when released is an incredible accelerant. Um, if you melt all the ice in the Arctic, and we're doing just about that sometimes already, it becomes a heat absorber instead of a heat reflector. There are half a dozen of these ways in which the natural systems just accelerate and let loose and make runaway what mankind is doing. Um, I'm going to say mankind that time instead of humankind. How about so, um, so when you're confronted with those phenomena of irreversibility and the potential for runaway systems, and you look at the wall of options coming at you for abating climate change, you have to begin to think very selectively. Uh, and so what we've done is triage, chop up the problem into sort of a 90-10 rule. 20 countries is 75% of the carbon dioxide. We have to focus on those 20 countries. China's number one, USA's number two, India number three, and so forth. The second cut is that there are four sectors. In the ener energy is 80% of the problem. Deforestation, land use is the other 20%, roughly. So in the energy world, there are four sectors that matter, which is your grid, your electricity grid, your transportation systems, your buildings, and industry. In each of those realms, there's tractable, there are tractable solutions. So this is, this is what I always try to get to is, is do the math and go after the big items first because if we don't rapidly drive the carbon curves down, then we unleash those natural systems. You anticipate, and I'm gonna play two short clips in a, in a, in a visual. Um, just today, Governor uh, uh, Baker was in Washington. He was testifying at the House, Full House Commerce uh, uh, Committee uh, on climate change. It was the first climate change um, uh, hearing 
Thank you, thank you. Um, <laughs> in eight years, I mean, that's, that's astonishing. That's embarrassing. I, I was surprised that, that, that Obama, that didn't happen in the other administration. But let's, this is uh, Baker today testifying. It's a very short clip. My feeling is, had this been mentioned in the State of the Union, it would have transformed the administration and maybe the future of the planet. Listen to this 12 seconds. The Massachusetts climate change is not a partisan issue. While we sometimes disagree on specific policies, we understand the science and know the impacts are real because we're experiencing them firsthand. That's a Republican. Is that remarkable? Do you agree with me that it, it is remarkable? And, and I would urge everybody to uh, find that testimony. It's, it's on the web under the House Committee uh, on Natural Resources. Natural Resources. But I'm sure it'll pop up on many other websites. But it's a brilliant piece of testimony. Uh, it's testimony I wouldn't have been embarrassed uh, to have written myself. I didn't write it, but uh, mm -hmm. if I had, uh, I'd be uh, proud of it. Mm -hmm. And uh, Charlie, Charlie Baker really has done a remarkable job of uh, pulling together the essence of that, uh, of that issue in that testimony. But he's also uh, really, particularly in, his, uh, in, in the last couple of years, been leaning forward on climate change. Uh, Massachusetts, by the way, is currently 21% below its 1990 level of greenhouse gas mm -hmm. emissions, uh, well on the way to achieving the target, uh, well on its way to achieving the target in its 2008 uh, legislation, mm -hmm. establishing uh, a target for reducing greenhouse gas emissions in this state. It's uh, and they're coming up with as well. They're coming up with interim targets for 2030, 2040. The, the target is 80% reduction from 1990 by 2050. 2050. Yeah. And these are good targets. Uh, they're targets that in the Obama administration we embraced uh, similar targets for the United States as a whole. The federal government uh, under uh, President Trump has uh, backed away from, from all of those. But the good news is, like most stories, this is a good news, bad news story. The bad news is that the uh, Trump administration has backed away from everything sensible that this country was trying to do in terms of the federal government's actions. But there has arisen an enormously powerful backlash represented by something called the America's Pledge, which has in it 22 states, 500 companies, uh, more than 500 cities. Uh, all of whom have the motto, we're still in. The United States may be uh, backing out of the Paris Accords, but as the federal government, but most of the country is not. And Massachusetts has been in the lead, not only in embracing effective methods of reducing greenhouse gas emissions, but in the lead as well in investing in measures to build up our preparedness, our resilience, our adaptation to cope with the changes in climate that can no longer be stopped. So ironically, could Trump be good for climate change? <laughs> that's, that's too big a stretch. Yeah. Uh, and it's too big a stretch because much <coughs> of what the federal government was doing is not readily replaced by action at the state level, the corporate level, uh, the city level. The city of Boston is another great example. The yeah. city of Boston has a fabulous set of programs both for reducing emissions and for building up resilience. Right. And, and uh, Mayor Walsh is to be congratulated and all of his deputies who've been running these extraordinarily forward-leaning programs. <laughs> I mean, again, we are fortunate that this state and this city are leaders in taking the kinds of actions that are required all across the country and ultimately around mm -hmm. the world to get our arms around this problem. But it's very hard to compensate for the cuts that President Trump has imposed on federal research and development on advanced energy technologies, very hard to compensate for his having cut off our assistance to countries in need for both mitigation and adaptation. A fundamental part of the bargain in the Paris Climate Accords was that the industrialized nations would assist the developing countries with both emissions reductions and with adaptation. The United States was going to play a big part in that. Trump has cut all that off, and it's too much money. We were aiming for $100 billion a year by 2020, mm -hmm. of which it was expected the United States would provide perhaps a quarter, $25 billion a year. 
That is hard money to replace at less than the federal level. But lest we begin a spiral of despair here. All right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> One has to remember that the way energy policy is set in America is substantially at the state level, state by state. So when you write your check to the utility company or Venmo it or whatever you do, um, that, those dollars will either land on coal or natural gas or solar or wind. And the decision about where your money lands, your existing cash flow lands, is up to state public utilities commissions, one by one. There are 50 of them. Uh, so they decide the future of the grid in America, substantially. The feds have a, a role, but it's mostly a state deal. States set building codes. The city of Santa Monica now has a zero net energy requirement. When you build a building, it has to produce as much energy as it consumes each year. That's kind of cool. California is not quite so advanced. I'm going to do my own bit of coastal chauvinism here. I hope you don't mind. Um, but uh, California building codes are so tight now that they've reduced energy consumption by 80% compared to pre-code. And they automatically get tighter every three years. So continuous improvement is a really nice legislative idea. Instead of going back to the legislature and having a battle for the next increment in progress, put in a rate of change. How about 3% better every year or 4% better every year? Compounding year after year. So you got your transportation, uh, sorry, you got, you've got the grid and buildings are controlled state by state. Transportation is a mixed bag. So the federal government is charged with setting fuel efficiency standards for vehicles or CO2 per, per mile or kilometer standards. Um, but there's a wrinkle in the Clean Air Act that allows California to get out ahead of the feds. And any other state can choose either the federal path or the California path. So roughly half the American population now lives under a California regime. Tom Friedman said uh, the resistance to Trump is not the Democratic Party, it's California. <laughs> so I'm going to go with that. So now you have three of your four sectors with breakaway potential and breakaway reality. Seven governors were elected last uh, November with clean energy pledges, very powerful ones, mm -hmm. down to zero in a number of instances. For the grid, it's not for everything, right? Um, but right. there are options here. I want to return to something you said, Hal, about, about the Arctic, because there, was, there is a, 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 a doctor at, at Woods Hole Research Center who I spoke to in December. She was testifying here before Senator Pacheco's um, uh, hearing, uh, and she said- I'll Probably soon to follow. That's right. Yeah. That's right, Susan, the Natale. Research, right? Susan Natale, she's an expert in Arctic um, environmental research, and her testimony was, I mean, she kept on using the word dire. So afterwards, I went into the hall and got her on my phone. I'd even, I left my recorder just recording the hearing. But let's listen to her, and then you'll see this graphic of what she's saying. Temperature increase in the Arctic is happening twice as fast as it is in the rest of the planet. And the reason that's important to people in Massachusetts is because there are a number of feedbacks or a number of processes that happen in the Arctic that also impact everyone else on the planet. So one of them is carbon emissions as a result of thawing permafrost. So as we re emit fossil fuels in the lower latitudes or different parts of the planet, um, it causes the Arctic to warm faster and then the Arctic in turn is releasing greenhouse gases as all this large amount of carbon that's stored in permafrost is released into the atmosphere. So the longer we take to act to reduce fossil fuel emissions, there's that much carbon that is in addition to coming out of the Arctic that we're currently not accounted for. I, I call that the Katie bar the door. Uh, scenario that is, you know, because we'd have runaway climate change if that happens. If the permafrost is defrosted, releasing the methane, it's. And it has started. Uh, one of the things that Sue Natale does at the Woods Hole Research Center is actually make measurements of the rate at which uh, Arctic permafrost is thawing and releasing methane and carbon dioxide. And it's very compelling that if you look at the inventories, there's two and a half times more carbon in the permafrost than is in the atmosphere today. Right. And, and uh, uh, it's not a advanced mathematics keep to figure out that if any, if any substantial fraction of that is released, yep. we're cooked. Um, but I agree with Hal, we have to avoid descending into a despair spiral. And, uh, and there is uh, a whole series of upsides, uh, many of them in what states, businesses, individuals, civil society organizations yeah. can do. And one of the upsides that's very important is that the responsible media are coming around, finally, beginning to give environment in general and climate change in particular the attention they deserve. Mm -hmm. Now that's partly 
because the symptoms have become so conspicuous mm -hmm. that it is no longer plausible to ignore that we are changing the climate in ways that are increasing the intensity and duration of heat waves, that are increasing the frequency of torrential downpours and resulting flooding, that are increasing the incidence and size of wildfires, that are raising sea level to the point that in Miami the streets flood regularly at high tide. Um, and of course, this being uh, a coastal city where we sit, uh, we are particularly vulnerable to the increases in sea level that, in my judgment, now quite clearly are accelerating. That is, uh, the pace at which sea level is increasing is not constant. The pace itself is increasing. And it is now plausible, in my judgment and that of many other climate scientists, that we will be looking by 2050 at something in the range of a meter of sea level rise, uh, three and a third feet in round numbers, and that by 2100 it could be two meters. We don't know that for sure because the processes that govern the rate of disintegration of the Antarctic ice sheet and the Greenland ice sheet are not well enough understood to predict this with any uh, degree of confidence. Mm -hmm. But it's well within the range of plausibility that we'll see a meter in 2050 and two meters in 2100. Which is why in October with the, there was a special report by the IPCC, the UN you know, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, came out with a study which you probably read or heard about, probably on our radio, about um, the keeping the, the importance of keeping the global surface temperature at 1.5 degrees centigrade. Uh, avoiding above, the increase going above one Above and a half, yeah. going one and a half. Right. And two, right. forget it. The two would be what, three well, points? And two was the internationally agreed target uh, up until the time of the Paris conference. Right. When at Paris they added as an aspirational goal, it would be better to keep it at one and a half. But then they commissioned a study of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change to look at the difference between one and a half and mm -hmm. two. And currently, by the way, we're just over one degree. Celsius or 1.8 degrees mm -hmm. Fahrenheit, a little less than two degrees Fahrenheit. But, but here's what they said: they, this, I had to pull this. If, if we want to hold the line to 1.5 degrees centigrade, we have to slash emissions by about 45 percent from 2010 level by 2030. By 2030. Yeah. That's 12 years. That's 11 years. <laughs> you know, it's a it's a budget. There's a carbon budget for the Earth. So because carbon stays up in the atmosphere essentially forever, in, in human terms, you can, you can use the word forever, um, you, you can only emit so much. Uh, and so therefore, if you've, already, if you've already used up most of your budget, you have to drop down to zero very quickly. What we do to the atmosphere is emit things. What the atmosphere does to us is concentrations. The concentrations stay, the emissions go up and down, or the, basically only up in human history, but now they have to go down. So because carbon stays in the atmosphere essentially forever, no matter what concentration you want to land in, ultimately 450 parts per million, 550, 650, you still have to go to zero emissions. You have to get down to zero emissions to stabilize anywhere or near zero. And the consequence of that is the sooner you start, the easier it is. Because, because economic dislocation is proportional to how much of the economy you have to retool. How many coal-fired power plants do you have to shut down and replace with wind turbines, for example? And if we wait longer, then there's more factories built globally, more inefficient houses built globally, more crappy cars built globally that have to be replaced, sometimes before their economic life is used up. When you look at a 12-year period and you think of retooling the entire industrial economy so that it doesn't require fossil fuels, that's a pretty big job. But the interesting thing I find is that if you do that, if you have to do that, it makes you more efficient. Yes. Am I right? You and get more efficient and you, the, the limit in the end is often the capital investment that you have to put in and the pace at which you have to put it in to get to that higher efficiency. It's great in the long run, but you know, one of the things that few people realize is that the global energy system that we have today, 80% fossil fuel, represents a capital investment of about $25 trillion. $25 trillion in electric power grids, power plants, oil refineries, drilling rigs, pipelines, wind turbines. If you had to build it all overnight, it would be $25 trillion. That investment turns over ordinarily in 30 or 40 years. 
And what we're talking about now is what if you have to turn over a $25 trillion investment in 12 years? Mm -hmm. uh, and that, people in this audience will readily recognize, is a big problem. But, you know, but we had an energy transformation or re revolution about 12 years ago. Right? It was when fracturing, hydraulic fracturing, uh, uh, released you know, natural gas from these formations. Marcellus, and, and Colorado has them, they've got them in Europe. And, and so now, in just that much time, we went from, what, uh, like 15% of our electricity was generated by, in here in Massachusetts, New England, with, with natural gas. In 12 years, it's almost 60%. revolution underway right now and it's pretty profound and important um, I'll give a, a quick example and then mention a couple technologies the CEO of Excel Energy Excel is a five-state utility uh, from Minnesota Colorado down to Texas has committed to going to hundred percent clean energy by 20 I think it's 2045 maybe 2050 right. right so yes quite in line and he is doing this or they are doing that without the government mandate they're far exceeding all government mandates why are they doing this they're doing it because it's cheaper to put windmills in the ground than pay the operating only costs of, a coal of an existing coal-fired power plant, right? It's cheaper to build, let alone fuel? Completely. Completely build from scratch a wind farm in Colorado is now cheaper than just the operating cost of a coal-fired power plant. So if you can turn over your capital stock and save money in the doing, and then you split that saved money between consumers, between retired coal miners, and between the utilities. So that's with the out of governmental mandate, no incentives, no tax write-offs? The government had to get it going. And, and so the, the, the magic in this business is called a learning curve. It's the speed at which technology prices are reduced as a function of their, their deployment. So wind prices have dropped by more than half in the last decade. They're now down to four cents a kilowatt hour, which is about one-fifth of the retail price that, in America. This is, this is land wind. This is land wind. But offshore wind has dropped in price by 50% in the last six years. It's, we just had signed contracts six and a half cents per kilowatt hour. Which is astonishing. And by the way, you can put these things so far away that you can't even see them from Cape Cod. If they're 12 miles out in the ocean, <laughs> not saying anything, but if they're 12 miles out in the ocean, you can't see them because of the curvature of the earth. And they've now learned how to float these things so you don't have to go super deep. You can, you can put them on the California coast where the ocean floor is incredibly deep. One of those windmills powers 8,000 homes year-round. And the wind blows offshore a lot more often than it does onshore. And it's counter-correlated with onshore wind significantly. So it smooths out the onshore wind mm -hmm. supply to your electricity. Mm -hmm. So the, the point is simply that if we can drive enough of these technologies down the learning curve, and if we can learn to manage, we have to manage the grid quite differently when you have a lot of intermittent renewables. Uh, if you can do those two things, then you unleash the private sector to be your friend instead of your enemy. Which it has to be. We have to, we have to do this. We have to get this done with the full participation of the private sector. That is, uh, a a as, as I was putting in paragraphs I was writing for Al Gore and Bill Clinton when they were running for the president and vice president positions in 1992, I said, the companies and the countries that figure out first how to deliver the goods and services that people want in environment sparing and energy saving ways are going to make a lot of money at it. And we are only going to solve these problems when the private sector is a partner in the solutions rather than uh, an opponent. And we are seeing that happening. I mean, I agree with Hal, there's a lot of good stuff happening. I've been in meetings with the CEOs and the senior vice presidents of many of our biggest energy companies. And they're all moving in this direction in part because their customers are demanding it. Uh, it's not simply that it's making increasing economic sense, but the customer base is saying, we want this done in a way that spares the environment, that spares the climate. That's good news. The bad news is we have to do it faster. Yes. This has to happen so faster, we, so and it's going to need help from the Congress. Uh, so it's so incentives, mandates, market mechanism. And additional investments in research and development which have driven the advances we're using up until now mm -hmm. and which need to drive more advances that we use for an encore yep. in 2050 and beyond. Mm -hmm. If we don't make those investments, if we don't invest in R&D, in understanding how to do this better, we're going to uh, fail to do enough over the long run. I, I mean, you know, they're getting it. They, three years ago, two years ago, it was the first uh, sale of the 
uh, a Bureau of Ocean Energy Management uh, for the offshore leases in, in, in off the coast of Martha's Vineyard. Uh, they couldn't give it away. They, they had a, they, they, I think they went for a dollar an acre or something like that. And, and there were no bidders in some cases. Now it's hundreds of millions of dollars. Yep. It's astonishing. So so and that's in just the th three, two, three years. So the, the, the eastern seaboard, it's hard to cite wind, and the sun never shines here, so far as I can tell. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, today it was a little bit. But, um, <laughs> so, very good. So you want you want some alternatives, um, yeah. and these new offshore wind turbines uh, are are just incredible. There are other learning curves <coughs> that are happening too. You know, the electric cars started out very expensive. I had, as I mentioned earlier, these lead acid batteries. Those are horrendous, mm -hmm. horrendously bad. Um, the new one cars, of course, have lithium ion batteries, and those are getting cheaper and they're getting better. Mm -hmm. They're down their own price curve, mm -hmm. uh, and so there are now good. I mean, excellent electric cars that you can buy for twenty-five or 30000 bucks, and those will keep getting cheaper and cheaper. I was in Shenzhen, China, which is a city of about 12 or 13 million people near Hong Kong. It's a newish city. It's a, it advertises the greenest city in China. Every single one of their 17,000 uh, buses is an electric bus. Every single taxi is an electric taxi. Every delivery vehicle is electric. And every Didi, which is their Uber, will be electric by the end of this, this year, right? So they had to shrug their, they had to square their shoulders a little bit. They had to put in some charging. They had to pay a little more, but the, the, amount, the amount extra they had to pay got smaller and smaller as these technologies went down the learning curve. Mm -hmm. So this is what we have to do. John's exactly right. It's a public-private partnership. Uh, because we have to move fast, we have to find uh, opportunities to drive technologies down the learning curve and to deploy them en masse wherever we can. I hope every day, wrote an article yesterday in the New York Times op-ed section, that this Congress can do some things, and the next Congress can do a lot more. We'll see. Mm -hmm. um, but in the meantime, we can't wait for that to happen. In the meantime, we have to deploy, deploy, and deploy some more. Before we start taking questions, and we're going to start taking them just a minute or two, uh, a carbon fee, I hesitate to use the word tax because, well, we can use the word tax. Carbon tax, the idea of in making fuel oils uh, more expensive uh, and levelizing those, those costs, making them and equal. It doesn't just make fossil fuels more expensive. It starts to internalize the costs that we are all paying in the form of environmental damage from the use of those fuels. Mm -hmm. um, the single most effective measure we haven't taken yet as a nation would be to put a price on carbon has emissions. Anybody, has any country done that? Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, the Nordic countries uh, have done a great job with that. Um, Mexico has a $1 per ton tax on carbon. But, it, yeah, but they're going to need like 40, bu 40 well, bucks a ton. So, so, so California has a carbon cap, which is clearing today at about 20 bucks a ton. And New England has a carbon cap for the electric grid, right. and they're talking about doing it for transportation as well. So there's a backdoor way of doing these things. Again, not as efficient and effective as a progressive federal government would have it, but let's get it going. It turns out it didn't crush the California economy. We're now the fifth largest economy in the world. We were the 10th largest when we started the carbon cap. So I'm not saying it's because of that, but that's not a bad result. Wow. Questions? Please, over there. Are we good? Yeah. Listening to the State of the Union last night, when everybody cheered that the U.S. was now finally an uh, energy exporter, I kind of cringed. Like, how does that thinking that we're cheering that we're exporting energy square with the new reality that we need to be carbon neutral? Is my first question. Like, other countries have this. Norway has a lot of oil. Scotland, people that have oil are exporting it. But meanwhile, at home, they're providing their domestic needs with all renewable resources. So I don't know if you can shed some light on that mentality that's um, articulated publicly and what public and private people are wanting to do. And my second question is, I read an interesting thing recently about out of San Diego of people do, work doing research on plants that are trying to use um, sort of carbon sequestering in their deep plant roots. Mm. Um, and was just wondering if everybody could just go garden and plant, and that might help. <laughs> well, number one, exporting energy may have some benefits uh, for the economy. 
Uh, but we need to remember, all of us need to remember, that our well-being is sitting on a three-legged stool, one leg of which is the economic leg, but another leg of which is the environmental one, and the third one is our social and political and cultural institutions. And if we try to build up any one leg in a way that whittles down the other, the stool is going to fall over. And that's how I think about uh, exporting fossil fuels today. On the other side of the question, uh, I think this is another example of very important work that is going on. I mean, one of the things that is resistant to initiative is how to replace the fossil fuels in the part of the transport sector that consists of jet airliners. Uh, we're not going to run jet airliners on batteries anytime soon. Uh, we're probably not going to run them on fuel cells powered by hydrogen anytime soon either. Uh, we need advanced biofuels that are produced in sustainable ways and that have a net carbon impact on the atmosphere of zero because when the biomass was growing, it pulled out of the atmosphere exactly as much carbon dioxide as goes back in when it's burned. Uh, we're going to need those at very least to put in our aircraft. Great. Please. Yes, right there. Right in the middle there. Stereo. Okay, stereo. <laughs> Hi, I want to um, address the issue that I think you've been talking about here with the uh, infrastructure that we are now continuing to build in our state and many other states, and that is the uh, gas pipelines that are coming in here. You mentioned the uh, fracking of gas and how you know we've, uh, we've made a revolution in that. Well, it's a bad revolution. It's not a good deal. And um, I want to speak to what John's, John's point is, if we're um, you know, going to put a lot of sort of kudos to Charlie Baker for going to Washington to talk and give a speech that you would have been glad to give down there, John, I'd like to see him act up here in a way that reflects what he said in Washington today. Um, he, he went down there, but he has not yet even had the courtesy to say hello to a woman named Andrea who's been sitting in his office for over 100 days. He has not spoken to her once. Why is she sitting there? She is sitting there because there's a compressor station that is being built in the Four River Basin of Weymouth where people are already facing toxic, poisonous situations just from what's built there. The health impact study that was done in that compressor is abominable. It didn't come close to what the toxins are that are going to be spewed out into this community where families live around. And the explosiveness of this. Uh, just today in San Francisco, there was another gas leak explosion. You can look at it online. It's a pretty awesome fire. So Charlie Baker has ignored you know, the health departments of 59, 59 boards of health who have written to him to say, stop this compressor station. Stop the fracking that is going on in Pennsylvania. Stop bringing that through. And the bottom line is it's for export for somewhere else, while the citizens of Massachusetts are facing so the toxic a consequences. Couple points, a couple points. We're so going to, tomorrow we're going to have a story, a short story, uh, um, which I think I'm surprised that hell out of you, it'll surprise the hell out of me. Barbara Moran is doing it, and it's about uh, the people that did that health study. And there's some very surprising information, and that'll be tomorrow, I think, tomorrow, right, Barbara? Yeah. And, uh, it, yes, and just- Yeah, I, I thought that was a very powerful statement, and uh, I hope some, somehow that Charlie Baker ends up watching the live stream uh, or the recorded stream of this conversation, because he has, I think, made some progress in his thinking about climate change, but that doesn't mean he's yet doing everything right. And I think, again, that was a very powerful statement. Uh, and uh, I, I hope it somehow comes to his attention. And I spoke to someone just today, just before this happened, to, uh, in Nova Scotia, where there's a Maritimes and, and Northeast pipeline, which used to go north to south in terms of the flow of, of natural gas. Now they want to use that compressor to send it south to north. More than half of the energy, is, we're just going to be a way station for Nova Scotia, which is then going, there's four projects there. They're going to turn it to LNG, liquid natural gas, liquefied natural gas, and export it principally to Germany. 
Um, so th th these are the geopolitics of the energy flow and the, and the pipeline. There's, there's, a very, there's a very important point here, and, and it's really good you raise this, which is when you build infrastructure, it has a long life. And when you build it, things become economically feasible because the marginal cost is low when it wasn't before. So if we put in more pipelines or build more coal-fired power plants uh, or LNG export terminals, they're going to get used. The principal obstacle is, not be, is increasingly not economics, but incumbency. It's the fighting back of the coal companies and the oil companies and the gas companies, because they have political power, they have economic power. And so it might be cheaper to build wind in Colorado. Uh, it might be not be physically, uh, sorry, politically feasible. It turns out it is in Colorado because we like sunshine there um, and fresh air. <laughs> but in much of the world, that's not the case. That's not the bargain people are going to make. The, uh, the other very important point that was embedded in that comment is that climate change is by no means the only environmental problem. It's the envelope within which many others uh, also take place. But toxification of the environment is an enormous problem. And bringing it back to the oceans for a minute, since we started with an appropriate emphasis on the oceans, one of the stunning recent projections is that by 2050, the mass of plastic in the ocean will be greater than the mass of fish in the ocean. Learn uh, to eat plastic. Talk, talk, <laughs> about, talk about the toxification of the environment. I mean, this yeah. is really stunning. And we need to get our arms around that problem as well in many different dimensions. Uh, yeah. We are drowning in plastic. Yes, sir. You, sir. Yes. Yes. And secondly, oh, I'm sorry. where in your thinking does this role of nuclear power play if it is politically feasible? Good questions. Now, those are both good questions. Uh, let me take a quick crack and then Hal can disagree with me. <laughs> uh, f first of all, in terms of combustion, natural gas releases less carbon dioxide per unit of energy than coal does, and in the middle is oil between those two. You have to watch out in the case of natural gas, though, because in the natural gas production system, if there are even moderate <coughs> leaks of methane, methane is so much more powerful per molecule as a greenhouse gas, as a heat-trapping gas, than carbon dioxide is, that you can offset the combustion advantage by the leaks in the system. And it only makes greenhouse gas sense to use natural gas if you can control the leaks in the production and distribution system to a very low level. And Trump has asked that those... That we back off of those restrictions. Yes, absolutely nuts. Uh, the, the, the second question about <coughs> nuclear energy, my answer to that question is it would be easier to address the global climate change challenge if we could get a significant contribution from nuclear energy. But there are four <coughs> hurdles that would have to be overcome before we could expect a large contribution from nuclear energy going forward. Its contribution to world electricity has actually been falling. In the United States, it's still around 20 percent. But in the world, it's down to about 11 percent of our electricity. The hurdles that have to be overcome, number one, it's too expensive. Number two, while we're making it less expensive, we also have to make it safer, including safer against deliberate acts of malice. That is, we not only have to protect <coughs> against mechanical failures we have to, and, and human mistakes, we have to protect against saboteurs. Third, we have to figure out how to manage the radioactive waste in a way that is acceptable not just to the technical community, but acceptable to the public. And number four, we have to figure out how to break <laughs> the link between the spread of nuclear energy capabilities worldwide and the spread of nuclear weapons capabilities. Uh, my own view is that all of those problems are soluble in principle, but I'm agnostic on whether we will be wise enough to solve them in practice. So I think, again, it's beneficial to work on solving those problems. I support uh, research uh, to address them, that research uh, has been going on in many parts of the world, continues to go on, although U.S. government support for it has dwindled uh, right. in the last couple of years. But they have very ambitious projects that are spinning off from MIT, your alma yeah. mater. And well, that's, that, we, that's in fusion as well mm -hmm. as in fission. But and we should say you're a nuclear engineer, but in I, plasma side, which is... I, I cut my teeth in fusion energy and plasma physics. <coughs> Never mind. Very short teeth. 
<laughs> yes, sir. Thanks. Ma'am? So if you think about the, or consider the community of people who will rise to address these issues, and you think about the thought leaders at the top, and then maybe the activists and the agitators, there has to be like a base of lemmings <laughs> who aren't going to be agitating or thought leading, but who just want to be told about some basic hygiene. What can you do as someone with limited bandwidth and imagination, but a genuine desire to be able to wake up every morning and feel okay about what they're doing? <laughs> what can you offer in a very unromantic way, like top three things, field guides for environmental lemmings to <laughs> 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 handle themselves hey, with dignity? Well, I, I put my faith in the younger generation, and so I'm going to ask Hal yeah. to answer that question. <laughs> You know, I left the younger generation some years ago. Um, <laughs> so there's, there's what you can do as a consumer and there's what you can do as a citizen, and they're both important. Uh, let, let me start with the consumer side. Um, the, the, the first thing is if you are able to, if you own your home, get it audit, audited for energy leaks. It um, doesn't cost much money to fix it. The payback's usually very quick. That's probably your first or your second biggest consumer of energy. Transportation will be the next one. So for sure, next car you buy, make it electric. Better yet, get on your bike. Or what I did is I got an electric assist bike. I mean, I've been riding my bike for years, but then I tried one of these new ones and it made me feel like Superman. <laughs> and, and seriously, I go 15 miles on hills every day, each way. Absolutely no problem. It's a blast, in fact. So this is this sort of micro mobility, scooters and electric bicycles. There are 200 million electric bicycles sold in China already. And they're replacing cars often. Uh, mass transit is pretty cool too, but it shouldn't be allowed to become a second class option, right? If it's slow and stinky and dark and not reliable and unsafe, forget it. Nobody's going to want to use it. So, so, so go talk to the people that work those transit systems. So let me talk about the citizen side. The usual answer is vote better. You probably do a good job of that already, but not everybody does. Um, or write a letter to your paper or write a letter to your congressman. Those are all fine. But I would advocate a more precision type intervention. Go back to those four systems and ask who makes the decision about where your utility bill lands. And it turns out it's the Public Utilities Commission. There are three people or five people in every state that are either appointed or elected, and they get to decide half the carbon in America goes through monopoly pipes and wires. So get to know those people. Send them a letter. Go to one of their hearings. It's, a, it's actually quite interesting. You don't have to become an energy nerd, but you can bring in the ethical response to what we're doing in front of the people who get to make those decisions. Who decides about transit systems? Who decides about the next uh, acre, lane mile of highways? Who decides where your utility bill goes? Find that out and be that public citizen because you'll be a thousand times more effective than the generic one who writes a letter. And the Department of Energy. That's good. The Massachusetts Department of Energy Resources has just announced its new three-year energy efficiency plan, which includes a free home audit of your energy systems. And in homes that use propane or, or, or fuel oil, they'll, they'll pay like 75% off of new he heat pumps, air heat pumps, which are enormously efficient. Mm -hmm. So there are things there, there are incentives that you can take advantage of. Please, sir. John, you mentioned earlier Massachusetts has been relative to uh, 1990 goal. Can you be specific as to why you think that, why Massachusetts has been successful? Well, because the, yes. so the, the, the question was, why has Massachusetts been as successful as, as it has in reducing greenhouse gas emissions in this state below the 1990 level? And I think it's a combination of all the sectors that Hal talked about. Uh, that is, uh, we're using less energy in our buildings. Uh, the Woods Hole Research Center in Massachusetts, uh, when I was uh, director, finished a new building designed by an environmental architect, Bill McDonough, uh, with photovoltaics on the roof. And ultimately, we added a wind turbine in the front yard. And the thing is, one of those buildings that is generating about as much energy as it uses. Uh, there are more and more buildings of that sort 
in Massachusetts. Massachusetts has a well, relatively well-educated population. People uh, have learned about their opportunities. They're driving more efficient cars. They are uh, living in more efficient houses. The industries in Massachusetts have figured out uh, how much money can be saved along with energy saved by modifying industrial processes to make them uh, more efficient. I don't know, Hal may have something to add there, but. No, and then the, the State Public Utilities Commission has been absolutely terrific. Um, the state of Massachusetts. <laughs> <laughs> Tough audience They need the DPU in Massachusetts, so uh, they have uh, bones to pick. I better stick to California examples, <laughs> obviously. <laughs> but the, um, the, I mentioned before the East Coast uh, states joined in something called the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, which was a, basically a cap and trade system for the electricity side. It wasn't especially well designed the first round. It had a very mild impact, but it's being redesigned right now. This is an excellent opportunity to, to raise your voice and make sure that the next, what happened was the caps that they set were higher than the actual use. Oops. Um, <laughs> So, so the price of avoidance was very low. Right? Yes. <laughs> so it generated money, which everybody likes, but it didn't, it didn't drive down emissions. So they, you need to reset the cap price so the cap, that the cap volume excuse me, is lower than the actual demand or it doesn't make an impact. But that's only on the electric, uh, electric, only on the electric, uh, side. electric side. So the, really, 70% the, the, the of the energy savings that we've had, the, uh, the reductions, have come from electric generation. Yeah, yeah. So the big, big kahunas are vehicles. Yep, yep. And, and heating and, 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 and uh, heating and housing just, just, commercial. Just a word about heating, because in some ways, for people like me, the, the equation has flipped. When I was coming of age in the energy era, um, it was considered by, for environmentalists to be a sin to heat your house with electricity, because power plants were so inefficient and so disgustingly. And in fact, Amory Levin says, uh, heating a house with electricity is like cutting butter with a chainsaw. Uh, it's now the other way around. Yeah. I was asked the other day by a journalist, should new um, housing developments be prohibited from having a natural gas hookup? Yes. 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 Okay, there's your answer. <laughs> but, but one of the reasons, there are two reasons why this is now the right answer. One is we're producing more and more of our electricity from carbon-free sources, but the other is we've invented both more efficient houses with low emissivity windows, for example, but also somebody mentioned heat pumps already. Um, there are devices that basically take uh, very um, high quality energy in the form of electricity and multiply it so you get heat. And, well, and, and the air price of these has. And air conditioning. And, you and air conditioning. It. You run them backwards. And the price of these has plummeted even as their performance has increased. So watch this space. Yeah. Um, I think we have time for how much? Two or three. One here. One here. Okay, one there. Could, could you please uh, summarize the status of the technology for extracting carbon from the atmosphere? Ooh, good question. Yeah, let me make a comment about that. Um, it is certainly possible technically and has been demonstrated practically to suck carbon out of the atmosphere. And in principle, you could do that. You could pull carbon out of the atmosphere and sequester it in geologic formations where it would stay for a very long time. The trouble is, the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, while troubling from the standpoint of global warming, is only four hundredths of one percent. It's 0.04 percent. And the concentration of carbon dioxide in the smokestacks from fossil fuel burning power plants is tens of percent. It's 20 percent, 30 percent, 40 percent, depending on the kind of power plant. So it's much cheaper to extract the carbon dioxide from the smokestacks of fossil fuel power plants, as long as those exist, than it is to take carbon dioxide at that tiny concentration in the atmosphere and suck it out. We are working on technologies that will make it economically practical at a moderate carbon price. Let's say we end up with a carbon price of $50 a ton of CO2. That's about half as much as the best current carbon extraction and storage technology from power plant stack gases. But there are good possibilities to get that price below $50 a ton of CO2 from power plant stack gases. And it's very important that we do that because even if the United States was to rapidly get off of the remaining 30% or so dependent on coal for electricity generation 
and our ultimately get off our natural gas for electricity generation. A lot of coal is going to be burned in India. A lot yeah. of coal is going to be burned in China. Mm -hmm. We need to figure out the technologies that make it practical to grab that CO2. After we've grabbed all of the CO2 from burning fossil fuels and are no longer burning fossil fuels at all, it might make sense with much more advanced technologies than we have today to pull it directly out of the atmosphere. Although we do have a device. We have devices. To oh, pull. yeah, devices They're, will do it. They're no, just no, much no, too we have expensive. trees. Oh, trees, <laughs> trees. <laughs> That's, I, I, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that because we can do a lot with afforestation, with reforestation, with managing agricultural soils to store more carbon and release less when food is grown. But the best estimates that have been done suggest that if we could get a quarter of what we need in carbon reductions from those sources, that would be a great performance. So we should do it. Mm -hmm. We need that quarter. We need to grow those trees. We need to change those agricultural practices. But we still are going to need these other approaches as well. We can't solve the whole problem that way. But j just a, a couple <coughs> of important caveats on the idea of sucking carbon out of the atmosphere or even out of a smokestack. It is expensive. Um, it, if, you, if you suck it out of a smokestack, it actually makes that power plant less efficient, considerably less efficient. It uses 15, 20, 25 percent of the energy that you would have used otherwise. Storage technology, not, not clear. Um, and then scaling is a really big problem. I think it was um, uh, Lynn Orr who did the math mm -hmm. to, to get one fourteenth of your carbon problem solved with carbon capture and sequestration, you'd have to build a system as big as the global oil production system. Every well, every pipeline, everything. Yeah. And so so we, we should use it for the last mile, if, if you were, but we should not confuse it for what we need to do today. And, and I, I make, I'll make up an analogy. If you had a broken fire hydrant outside your house and it was just flooding your house, you wouldn't pick up a sponge and start cleaning up around the counter, right? <laughs> you, would, you would call the fire department. You would, get that, you would get that hydrant shut off. If we don't deal with the bulk of the problem using existing technologies rapidly, the other ideas are just cosmetic. Do we need a... So I was old enough to remember the, 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 you know, the space shot, the moon landing. Um, are we capable of that in this area? Do we need that? Is that where we, how we get from here to there? The, the moon landing was an easier problem. <laughs> much easier. Much easier problem. Uh, at the start of it, we knew everything we needed to know about the science and technology of getting to the moon and landing people on it. It was a massive exercise, but a problem when you're talking about the consequences of the way civilization gets 80% of its energy, and you're talking as well about consequences of how we manage land use, of how we grow our food, of how we manage or mismanage our forests, this is a far more difficult problem than the simple one of going to the moon, which required a, a very modest fraction of our resources, a modest fraction of our technical capability, a modest fraction of our technical talent. Uh, it was an inspiring feat, but much, much easier than getting our arms around the energy and climate change challenge. But, but let's, let's take a moment to talk about innovation. And of course, I feel like a, a midget next to John Holdren in this category. The energy is a technology business. You're transforming energies from one type to another, from, from chemical to electrical, for example. The more and better our technology is, the more options we have. We have super efficient windows in houses because of these incredibly thin in invisible coatings called low emissivity coatings that were invented at national labs and, and universities. With government funding. With government funding. <laughs> right. But, but the, the wrong approach is to say we need a miracle in technology to solve this problem. The right approach is to deploy what we know we need to deploy now. That will do two things. That's, that's element one. And element two is keep inventing more stuff. When, when I talked earlier about learning curves, it's, it's this rather magical thing of things becoming cheaper and cheaper, more affordable as you, as you buy more of them. The beginnings of the learning curve is real science. It's that hard, complicated, fundamental science that the Department of Energy is so good at. Then there's increasingly amounts of applied science that many national labs and universities do and a lot of venture capitals do. You're still above what's competitive. When things start to become commercially viable, there's another element of that learning curve that comes into play, which is economies of scale and better methods of production. We need all three 
of those systems operating full time. Some of them are going to operate on near-term technologies like today's solar PV, cheaper than anything else on the planet for new electricity in many parts of the world. Some of them are way out there, like fusion, and there's a lot in between. If we neglect any of those technologies, we're fools. We don't know where they're going to go. We don't know how fast they're going to go, but we can't afford to ignore them. Right now, we, uh, the energy companies spend 0.3% of their revenues on R&D. That's the wrong number. And you, know, and you know what IT companies spend? <laughs> 10 percent. 10 percent. Oh, yeah. right. Pharmaceuticals spend 20. Yeah. One last question, okay? A lot of candidates. <laughs> Over there. So you talked about a lot of benefits. Speak up, though, so everybody. Health benefits and jobs. You talked about those two things briefly. You've talked about a lot of things, a lot of benefits related to renewables, bringing in renewables on, and cleaner energy. Can you talk about jobs and health as two of those benefits? That's a real setup from uh, my friend Ted Saunders. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the, th there are a lot of co-benefits to the strategies that we need in an energy transition to help us address the climate change challenge, and one of them is health benefits from reduced emissions of what we sometimes call conventional pollutants, particularly fine particulate matter, particulate matter of very small diameters that tend to lodge in the lung and stay there, we can get uh, big reductions in the health damages from air pollution. Uh, uh, we can get big reductions uh, in other toxic emissions that are affecting our soil and our water by switching to renewable sources. And what we know from looking at the current systems is there is far more employment already in energy efficiency and in renewables than there is in the whole fossil energy sector. So, yeah, there are lots of co-benefits. That's why many people talk about win-win solutions to these issues. Uh, we can win in more than one way at once. Maybe they should be win-win solutions. Yeah, win-win <laughs> solutions. You guys are good. Thank you so much. <laughs> Dr. John Holden. Al Harvey, Al Harvey's book, Designing Climate Solutions, A Policy Guide for Low Carbon Energy. I am reading it. It really is terrific. I just encourage you to pick it up. And for the short version, catch Hal's op-ed piece with Justin Gillis in yesterday's New York Times. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> Bruce, can I ask one more question? <laughs> Sorry. You just did. <laughs> You can ask another. <laughs> if John and Hal had their druthers, what would you hope the media would do over the next couple of years to, to address this issue? Talk about uh, solutions. Yeah. The most important thing is to talk about solutions. People do have to understand, but they are coming to understand that there is a big problem that needs solving. What they're really ready for now is the understanding that it can be solved, that it can be addressed that there are sensible things to do that bring multiple benefits that are economic, that are manageable, uh, and that we can get on with. And uh, I think it's terribly important uh, that, the, that the media do that. And that's one of the reasons I was happy to come tonight. WBUR is a great radio station. BU is a great university. This new Cityscape initiative and the environmental initiative are, uh, I think, fabulous steps forward in the kind of effort that we're going to need from media across the nation to propagate the ideas, the understandings, and the solutions that people are ready for. Boy, I couldn't agree more. <laughs> so just a, a couple of things that are coming up in the, in the, in the city space. space. Um, we're going to have business in the era of climate change. It's going to be a five-part uh, WBUR series with Harvard Business School and the Boston University uh, Questrom School of Business. Uh, and then uh, Lobster Wars, which is a film by David Abel of the, of the Boston Globe. He, he, uh, it's an extraordinary film, and he'll be here on March 6th. Um, <clears throat> then uh, there's going to be, uh, let's see, on June 11th, Sonic Sea, a screening and conversation. Uh, it's, a, um, it's a movie uh, about uh, marine ecology and the National Marine Sanctuaries. It's, we'll have a screening and we'll have a discussion afterwards. There's lots of things that are going on here. I think we're gonna have 200 events 
just for the first year here. So dig in. Thank you. All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was really. Great.